Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. Well, what a video we have today. We'll be combing over almost 100 years of data to bring similar situations that we're seeing right now to light and obviously looking at the statistics around that. We've also got over $2 trillion of option expiration about to occur. And as many of you know, these doji candles that we've got appearing on the charts show us indecision and potentially equilibrium in these markets. So what happens here is going to be pivotal for potentially the next few weeks, if not the next few months. There's a lot at stake in these markets and we're about to break it all down for you right now. Heaps to watch. See you soon. I'm excited. All right, everybody. Well, welcome back to the show where we talk about markets around the world, including stocks, commodities, and cryptos. If you have any interest in either or any one of those, remember to subscribe and, of course, smash that like button. Let's talk about excessive pessimism versus optimism. Obviously, we want to understand the market dynamics. A lot of that has to do with the human psychology and the way that we are manipulated by the market to make certain generally poor decisions. I'm sure we've all been there. I'm looking at you right now and you're nodding your head saying, yeah, I, I've stuffed it up before. Don't worry. We all have. The key is, do we learn from it? So, of course, excessive optimism. Did we just see a peak on that? Well, of course, we're starting to get into a point where we saw it similarly in that March into April run. We're finding some kind of synergy between March and April and where we are in the markets right now. It's certainly an important chart. We also look at dumb money versus smart money as an important factor. Of course, dumb money has been getting more and more and more and more optimistic, while smart money is like, you know what, I'm a bit concerned about the current rally and they've maybe stopped purchasing in as such large quantities. That's something that we also need to look at. I've also reported here on the channel that we're still seeing a lot of hedge funds holding short positions. Now, they either will have to unwind that position should we move through this point of equilibrium on the markets or they will be correct. Now, Burry fo is focused on basically selling almost everything except for one stock. Obviously, you have a whole bunch of other people with strong opinions both way. The bull market's over. The, the bears are about to get control or this is the start of the new bull market. There's a lot of discussion points. We just want to look at the facts and what we're seeing in front of the charts. That's the best thing for us to do right now as it is confusing out there. So rejected by the 200 day moving average. Now, this is, of course, an incredibly important zone in these markets. You can see that we just rejected that zone. We'll look at that later on today in the charts. And something similar happened both through the 2000 crash and the 2008 and 2009 crash. We came back, we hit a level, and we rejected from that point. We'll look at the synergies later on. But what about if we go all the way back to the 1920s and 1930s and we pull the data from that perspective? Well, S&P 500, after being rejected in the two days after approaching the 200-day moving average, here are the stats, and this is what bodes for the future. Now, the interesting thing is really around the two to three month stat. So we've talked a lot about, of course, August, September and October, specifically September and October being when the big wigs come back. They've had their lobster lunches. They've gone on holiday in the US and they're coming back and they need to pay the bills. How are they going to do so? Potentially, it's time to sell the market, they say, and they smash down the those points in time and we'll show the stats around that. But for really 200 years, September has been the worst month of the year in the stock market. It doesn't mean it's always going to be, but it's certainly something that you must pay attention to. Notice here, two months after we get this reading, which would push, it, push us into basically mid-October, oftentimes less than a coin flip the market's up. And when you know your stats around markets, I think it's 59% of the time each day, the stock market is generally bullish. So if you're coin flipping, technically it's a bullish market almost all the time. This is a stat towards the bear. So not really a great data point for bulls in this current market. The bulls are all looking at breadth and fair enough. If we take breadth readings, which basically shows us how strong the market is in terms of recovery at the moment, it's still hanging below a point where it could turn. Now, we will get to the point that basically it's never really been a false reading, which is somewhere around 60%. You can see here back some of the previous readings. There are times where it's happened where the breadth has gone up and we've still crashed afterwards. It's incredibly rare. So at some point, even if you're feeling bearish on markets, you must admit defeat and then be able to switch. That's what 
really swing or position based traders will do and we'll explain that in another video moving forward but the breadth indicator while very good and certainly shows some incredible bullish movements at the same time hasn't quite hit that exact level where you'd say okay yeah we've got to give in and say okay well this, this is not a bear market rally anymore 2.1 trillion dollars of options are expiring here are some of the key levels that they're expiring in obviously a ton of money a ton of manipulation that could be had on friday you'll notice later when we do the recap of maximum pain that theoretically if they are to make the most amount of money possible they should be pushing the market down on friday it doesn't always happen that way but certainly options are pointing towards that direction i've brought this chart up a lot just because if you take all of history and you kind of overlay similar times in history we've got two big scenarios one of the scenarios is generally with a recession moving forward you can see here and that usually pushes us back into the lows if not slightly lower point but generally it's pretty close to the lows and then there's the other one without a recession where we get the goldilocks scenario and the market recovers which one will it be time will tell of course midterm elections volatility set to rise during the worst months of the year september being that one Will it happen? Well, no one's talking about it, so there's more chance that that could occur. September, during midterm elections, as you can see here, negative over a lot of history going back to 1928. So that's a pretty big stat. And if we think about earnings versus beat data, it's not like this is a fundamentally driven rally. It's a rally more driven by the Fed supposedly pivoting. Now, we do have some pretty good studies from, I think, Goldman Sachs that we'll be releasing over the weekend that talk about this pivoting concept in the markets. And I'll, I'll check that out and uh, make sure it, it looks legit. But I'll be sharing that on the weekend video. So make sure you subscribe for it. But only 60% beat rate beats 2,337, misses 1,557. Not that impressive. Another thing we can stack in the bear favor, and yes, I know it's been a bit bearish this video so far, is because we're seeing some of the signs that show us that way. XLP and XLU, what's going on here? That's a utility and a staple over the last five trading days have been the best sectors to be in. Now that is interesting. These are two very defensive sectors. Now, if you understand about money flow in the markets, the problem with a big hedge fund manager is they really don't have the option to just go all cash. They have to be invested in the market. So if they're about to dump or they're about to get rid of positions, what often they'll do is they'll go hide in the most defensive sectors. So of course, we're talking here about rotation and what a great time for us to talk about the sponsor of today's video, which is Tiger Brokers. So let's have a look at some of the tools that they offer us as traders and investors that I think are really amazing and actually really change the game in terms of being able to visualize these markets. First up, what's been strong over the last couple of days? So we mentioned utilities and we mentioned staples. Take a look here, hypermarkets and super centers, oil and gas and transportation, defensive kind of component there. These have been some of the strongest sectors of the last couple of days, 6.7%. You can go there, but you can also go over to industry and you'll be able to load up the best performers over a 20 day rating, a five day rating, etc., and then click on those to see which stocks are doing best. I love this, being able to click into here, see which one's doing best out of this, whether it's Walmart, Costco, any of the others, you can see it all there. And Tiger Brokers doesn't just stop with having these cool features. It also has full customization of your trade window. This is just an example. Of course, it's you'd set it up the way you feel like it, but you can put so much on these trade windows. The charts themselves, you already know they look damn good. And then you've got the options lines as well. You've got potentially the volume profile should you want to see your level data. And you've got your trade window, clock times for different areas in the world, different markets, news feeds. I mean, it's 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 really customization to whatever you want. So if you're interested in some of the special offers that Tiger Brokers is offering the community today, you can check them out in the description down below. I certainly think that they bring a lot. And you know the best thing about this broker? They're constantly improving and innovating in their platforms, whether it be the app or the desktop versions. You know I love that, guys. So thanks to them for sponsoring today's video. What about the VIX? Well, the VIX is sitting on basically turning from bully or bearish into bullish. Whenever you're underneath 20, generally people consider you in a bullish market. And when you're above 20, you're in a bearish or fearful market. We're at the same point as we were back in March into April and also February when we got those very quick rallies that ended up being sell-offs. A big point 
people are sick of me showing this chart, but I've got to show it to you because it's super important. What about yields? Yields remain high. Remember, this was where the inflation number comes out and everyone's like, oh, inflation's peaked. Hey, possibly it has, but we still have what we call sticky inflation. So that is rents, all these other reasons to be potentially uh, a bit, bit bearish on the market over the long term. It's not like we're going to cut rates anytime soon. We're still going to raise rates. The Fed's going to do so. They're data dependent. And at the moment, the yield curve kind of looks like this with a dropping potentially later half of 2023. So still some pretty big pain at these high rates for some time. Notice the two years barely moved, an important point. Now let's get into the big one though, guys. Dollar index, the king, the US dollar, the major here. It is really bulling. I mean, wow. We've been talking about the bull case scenario now for the last couple of days. Um, well, actually a little bit longer than that. It's It's been very bullish. In fact, the last two sessions, look at this massive strength. Now, you would think that that would mean the stock market would drop off. Usually it's cash going up, stocks going down. But we have a situation where we've got yields holding, cash going up, staples and utilities kind of going up and holding best, hitting a 200. You know, you can start to see why you could make a fairly bearish case around here. It really is somewhere around where the bears should get control of the market. Nothing's ever a guarantee, but it's an interesting stack of coincidences around this point. Dollar index has gone into what we would call the defended zone. It's actually taken the high out, which I've marked here for, wow, a long time now. 61.8 fib of the whole pullback, which is an interesting point. And if the US dollar is going to weaken, it should do so here. If it continues its strength, we may move all the way up into like a 108 or even a 108.50. We've got to be very careful in this area. The easy money was probably in here and down here when we've been talking about the dollar, but it could go ballistic. It could even make a new high. We don't know that yet. It's at a pivotal zone. Watch this on the smaller time frames. It'll be pretty important. That's also led on to the euro going through our defended zone here. Could the euro go under parity? It looks likely at this point based on what we're seeing with dollar strength. Notice it fell through this zone. Let's go and have a look at this on a two hour chart just to show everybody how big this area was. We basically had bull buys every single time. It's then taken this high trapping positions in. And a lot of you are probably screaming at me saying, Tom, I think it's a, I think it's a distribution. It's a distribution. You could certainly be correct. This is what we would call a UT or a UTAD, effectively a false break to the upside. Now it's broken to the downside. Based on this distribution curve, you would think underneath a dollar is actually on the cards. And this is similar to what's happened on the dollar index. So if all things are being equal, there could be further weakness here in the currencies across the board and strength, of course, in the major. Could this mean the stock market's about to fall over or tip? Well, that's something we'll find out soon. Gold's come into the perfect area that we hoped it would. 1755, fantastic. I'm gonna give you guys a clap because well done to you. It's pretty nice. <laughs> I'm pretty happy with it getting down to 1755. That's exactly where we wanted it to get to. Now we get to make some decisions. Okay, what, what's the next move for gold? Do we find bullish pressure? So there's some little bull levels that are going to signal potentially the turn for gold to the upside. I'm still incredibly open down here to the 1720-1715 zone. I still think that would make the most amount of sense. Obviously, a strong US dollar weakness in gold temporarily down to this zone, allowing the money flow to pick the position up. We'll find out whether it does so, but we've already suspected it coming down to this zone. This is the first start. The second would be here. Should the gold market turn though, we need to be ready for it. So what's going to happen next? Well, we need to look at our key pivotal zones. We have something around 1773. That's going to be a fairly important breakout. Should we get that? We may expect a pullback and then a rally through. We've also got a small little pullback down here. Price range top about 1761. Break above that could signal some strength of what we know has been a defended area so far in the markets through this bullish run. Gold's been pretty damn good recently, so I'm very happy with that. It's the 5% uh, time that you usually look at gold. Most of the time, I'm telling you, gold is a horror show, but sometimes it's very good. US oil also looking quite strong. Little close above that zone we mentioned yesterday, 90.70 here. So we've had strong oil 
We broke through the zone. I'd probably expect a little bit of weakness here on oil. Potentially around that 88, maybe buyers come back in now and push towards the 95. Of course, a break past 95 will solidify at least a short-term bottom in oil. I'm not really going to change my opinion over the next 6 to 12 months, which is oil lower. But this is trading and we've just seen a nice breakout. So probably weakness into strength would be the way that we would uh, see this chart at this stage. Nice pick up there. And it's similar in line with what we saw with copper. Little breakout, obviously new low. We'll find out whether this thing can do a turn. You'd be looking for turns on these types of charts. Of course, you guys need to practice your own uh, risk management there. Let's move over to Tesla. So if we add something like, let's call it a volume profile over this range, you'll notice that it's sitting right on the level that basically it's been sitting on for a while. Throughout this whole bit of the range, this has been the most important zone into one of the most important options expiries. So super critical area here. It's really exactly where you would expect the market to find some type of, I guess you would say, you know, selling or buying pressure. Obviously, if it does break out to the upside, uh, there could be a real ballistic move here. At the same time, you'd expect the S&P 500 to move above the 200 um, simple moving average or something like that and that to really ramp these markets across the board. If it's going to weaken though, back down to 840 and if it gets underneath 840, then we're going to do 775. I'm leaning into the bear side here, moving into this Friday, but you'll see the reasons as we go through the video. Now, as you might have seen on the meme, uh, Apple has been one of the, <laughs> the best stocks of the last couple of months. This thing's on a rip roar. It's almost at all time highs. I mean, it's just absolutely unstoppable. Little dojis formed here the last couple of sessions. Apple was the uh, straw that broke the camel's back last time back in March and April. When it tipped, really the market came with it. I'm looking at kind of around that 171 area on Apple. We'll go down to a smaller time frame chart, but look at this almost 37% off the lows now. If you've been in Apple, it's better than almost any of those uh, meme stocks. Hey, it's done incredibly well. So what level is pivotal? I've highlighted it here with this yellow line around that 171.80. We've got wick, wick, wick. We get underneath the wicks, we rally, we obviously we'd be looking to sell off. We've got gaps left on Apple. It just seems logical that this is around the right level. Where is it exactly correct? You know, these next couple of percentage points both ways, it's unlikely to continue a strong, strong rally without having a super pullback at some point. That's just the nature of markets. They always do it when you least expect it. People are so bullish Apple here. Calls everywhere, lots at stake on the expiration. BBY or Bed Bath & Beyond not doing uh, too good. It seems like, unfortunately, some people exited this position. Personally, I don't blame them. I probably wouldn't have been able to run it as hard. But look, we mentioned about this resistance. I do feel like people sold this zone and rightfully so. Huge gains. You know, it's not necessarily back in 2020 when everyone believes in the movement so hard. So unfortunately, that leads to some weak hands and those weak hands sell the position. Maybe it's uh, was Ryan Cohen or something like that. <laughs> uh, we'll move over here to the DAX. DAX, of course, selling off again. The long leg doji or the doji in here indecision or equilibrium before the friday options expiration this should be one of the weaker sectors or weaker indices should it fall over and the dax at this stage just hovering waiting for the lead most likely from the us market and the options at stake bonds and specifically high yield junk bonds they're realistically still finding weakness the bonds market's not really agreeing with the stock market right now I tend to trust the bonds guys. They know what's going on. In this case, the weakness seems to be in the bonds before the stocks. Maybe that's a forewarning. IWM versus the SPY. This is the Russell 2000 versus the S&P 500. Got a nice little kind of high here. Obviously, we're looking for a broad-based pickup. We want to see it get above this ratio so we can see the outperformance in the small beaten down stocks. At this stage, we have got weakness. Continue to watch that. We certainly will be on this channel. So make sure you subscribe to that one as well. NASDAQ, we'll move over here. Uh, look, NASDAQ was really just finding buying pressure off 13,400. It kept buying off it. We'll find out whether it actually weakens here on the Friday or goes up to push until it gets above the high here of 13,720. The sell is still absolutely potentially on the line. 
Uh, look, there's key levels everywhere. I'm actually a little bit confused by the NASDAQ chart in comparison to the S&P. And that's why I often use the S&P. And if you want to trade the NASDAQ, cool. But the S&P gives you cleaner levels. If you ever notice that NASDAQ sometimes takes your stop loss and you sit there yelling at the screen and you're like, why? Why did this happen to me? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the NASDAQ is a choppy beast because it's made up of technology stocks and growth stocks. So realistically, you know, if one of those moves like an apple, it's a huge weight in that in that uh, index. So it moves it quite a lot. Let's go over the S&P 500. Doji, doji, doji. It doesn't get much more like fair value between bulls and bears scrapping it out than here. This is really where we find some form of decision, you would think, over the next, whether it's be Friday or other days. We've taken out the high of the previous highs over here at 4,300. We've rejected the 200 and now we have gaps sitting all behind. So let's take a look at the actual futures market here. And I've labeled some of the most clean gaps. So we've got a 4207 and a 4123. Not exact, but pretty damn close. So these are all super important points. Notice the rejections here off this first trap level though, 4250. So if we break underneath 4250 and close, especially, what would that mean? Well, it means that We've gone under all of these previous wicks that have been buyers coming back in to show commitment. If that gets taken, then we move towards hopefully filling the gap, 4207. If we go through that level, where's the next logical zone, 4123. So we'll leave it at there in terms of what those projections are. Obviously for bulls, you just want a new high. 43, let me get the right zone, 4327-ish, I think. 25 was the high you wanted above there. Let's now have a look at the one hour time frame just to get a bit of an understanding of the markets. So they've got a couple of levels that they'll try to defend, you would think the bears. They'll defend the high, they'll defend 4301, and they'll probably try to defend around 4311. This is a, a scrap of the ages at this point, and you might go back down to remember this time in the market potentially in the future, it's just that important. So we've got 4250 on the bear side, obviously after that level, you'd think they're going to get some kind of control and push it towards the next zone. And you've got a lot of fighting in between here, which could go all over the place until we actually get under. Now let's take a look at the options expiration for the Friday. Now it's not fully updated, so I'd recommend you go and have a look at maximum pain into the open. My, my guess is it's probably gonna show around 415. And what that means is that if all of the options that are currently outstanding, remember Wall Street writes most of these options, so it's in their best interest to do this, were to expire worthless, they would push it towards 415 or at this stage 411 from what you've got in the data. That doesn't mean it has to happen. And certainly I wouldn't uh, program in to say, oh, 415 is absolutely going to happen on Friday. That's not how it works usually. But certainly it would make more sense to push the market down here to basically trap positions and especially make sure that they get the maximum profit from these markets. So whether that's a 420 or whether that's a 415 or even a 410, I don't know yet. It's just an idea. If you're seeing the price action break and it's in line with the max pain, it's another factor that you can bring into your trading and investment journey. What about Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin looks horrible. I mean, I haven't loved it for a while now. If Bitcoin's a precursor to the market, it looks disgusting. And it's coming into, of course, a big level of demand. If it busts this zone, we've already discussed it here. A few of you, being smart people that you are out there, have said, okay, well, what do you think about this as maybe a distribution? Here's like a UT, a UTAD, Again, distribution of price moving towards weakness. Certainly a, a factor there, maybe the US dollar being strong has also weakened Bitcoin at this point, but we're coming into the biggest key area ahead of one of the biggest options expirations. Certainly one to watch. Ethereum's done a little bit better, but it still looks pretty weak on the charts. We obviously had the head and shoulders concept and that's still pushing towards getting like a 1700 or even a low, a high 1600 on the charts. So just have a look at that 17, 
1680, find out whether if a market moves down there, I don't think it's unexpected. And I could see people having shorts in for, for that type of concept as well. If you haven't already, come and follow us over on Twitter. We always share great charts and a whole bunch of information. Join us in the Discord community or the private Discord community for the private streams pre-market as well. You can join the seven day free trial down below. And of course, if you're interested in any of the special offers today that Tiger Brokers are offering, you can check them out in the description down below. They've got a whole bunch of great software tools and features that we've had on this channel so much recently, and you can see them all there if you're interested. Thanks so much. Subscribe if you're having a good time and you're enjoying what you're watching. And of course, have a great weekend. We'll see you then and give it a like as well. Bye for now.